Now, I have since come to believe that the extraterrestrial portion of all of this is nonsense, but that the technology is real, is real. I believe that many of us were shown these documents over the years so that later we would talk about it. I mean, how can you keep the existence of extraterrestrials, if they were real, a secret? And how could anyone keep quiet knowing that they had seen documentation, official government documents, labeled top secret, that expressed that these extraterrestrials were real and had visited this earth. I wanted to know just how true all of this was, and I began a program of research to find out if extraterrestrials were real. What I discovered was amazing. What I discovered, ladies and gentlemen, is that there has been a plan in existence since about 1917, and probably before that, to create an artificial extraterrestrial threat to this earth in order to create a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-our-world invasion threat. And it continues on another page. Nevertheless, an effective political substitute for war would require alternate enemies some of which might seem equally far-fetched in the context of the current war system. It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal substitute for war. Are you beginning to get the message, folks? The Imperial Japanese Mission 1917, a record of the reception throughout the United States of the special mission headed by Viscount Ishii. And when the Imperial Japanese Mission was uh, in New York City, they had a dinner and some pretty famous people spoke at this dinner. One of them was John Dewey. John Dewey is the father of our failing, disastrous public education system. Here's what he said. Listen very carefully. John Dewey, professor of philosophy in Columbia University, who was the next speaker, was listened to with great intentness. He said, quote, Someone remarked that the best way to unite all the nations on this globe would be an attack from some other planet. In the face of such an alien enemy, people would respond with a sense of their unity of interest and purpose. Unquote. Now, bear in mind, folks, that's night. 17. Boy, these last few nights on UFOs have really stirred up the loony bin, I can assure you. Got a letter from somebody named Lita, and a few other letters from people castigating me, saying that I chickened out. Saying that I'm not telling the truth when I say I don't know if extraterrestrials are real or not. And they cite passages from my book, which they have not read. They claim to have read it, but like most who read my book, they have not read it. So I'm going to read them the parts that they skipped. And I'm also going to tell you, despite everything that's written in this book, there is no proof for the existence of extraterrestrial life in the universe or on this earth or in our skies. There are letters written by people who cannot be found. People who or wrote letters who can be found who will not comment on the letters. There is a letter written by an astronaut to the United Nations who now claims that he didn't write it. <laughs> and all kinds of things, folks. Despite what you read in this book that makes you think that extraterrestrials might exist, none of it is proof. Not one single bit of it. And that's the problem with this UFO subject. There is no proof. 
And when people read my book, they don't read what I wrote. They read what they want to hear. They read what tends to verify what they already believe or what they wish to believe. So, in my book, on page 196, at the beginning of the chapter concerning UFOs, entitled The Secret Government, under the paragraph-headed Perspective, let me read to you what you obviously did not read. And remember, this book has been in print for a whole bunch of years. Many sources of information were used to research this chapter. I originally wrote this piece as a research paper. It was first delivered at the MUFON Symposium on July 2nd, 1989, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Most of this knowledge comes directly from, or is a result of my own research into the top secret magic, spelled M-A-J-I-C, material, which I saw and read between the years 1970 and 1973 as a member of the intelligence briefing team of the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. Since some of this information was derived from sources that I cannot divulge for obvious reasons, and from published sources which I cannot vouch for, this chapter must be termed a hypothesis. A hypothesis. Now, I want all you loony bin people to go look that word up and make sure you understand what it means. I continue. I firmly believe that if, if aliens are real, this is the true nature of the beast. It is the only scenario that has been able to bind all the diverse elements. It is the only scenario that answers all the questions and places the various fundamental mysteries in an arena that makes sense. It is the only explanation which shows the chronology of events and demonstrates that the chronologies, when assembled, match perfectly. The bulk of this I believe to be true if, if, if the material that I viewed in the Navy is authentic. As for the rest, I do not know, and that is why this paper must be termed a hypothesis. I have since come to believe that the material that I viewed in the Navy is not correct, but in fact was a deception. And I base that upon an awful lot of evidence that you can count as proof. Now also, on page 234 of my book, I make it very clear what I believe. Very clear. In conclusion, number five, at the end of this chapter, on page 234, I say, and I quote, There is always the possibility that I was used, that the whole alien scenario is the greatest hoax in history, designed to create an alien enemy from outer space in order to expedite the formation of a one-world government. I have found evidence that this could be true. I have included that evidence in the appendix I advise you to consider this scenario as being probable, end quote. Now, I can't make it any clearer to you little loony cuckoos out there who want to run around and quote my book as proof that extraterrestrial life exists and is visiting this planet, you're off your rocker. You haven't read my book, and you're doing yourself, me, and everyone else an injustice when you do that. Just recently, there was an article in The Village Voice in New York City which claim, uh, makes the same claim. Whoever wrote the article claims that he researched me, researched my book and material that I do, and he has not. He's a liar. He's done no research at all. He claims that I say that extraterrestrials are real and that they're in an agreement with the United States government and that they're mutilating animals and human beings and all of this kind of stuff. And I've never said that I ever even saw anything that said uh, human beings were mutilated. So, folks, I just wanted to get that out of the way so that we can dispense with those wacko, ridiculous idiots out there who claim that they read my book and did not read it, in fact, at all. They went through it and picked out what they wanted to believe and read it. And then they quote me as being proof of the existence of extraterrestrials, and it's not true. I don't know if extraterrestrials exist in the universe or here. Due to the vastness of the universe, I would never make any kind of a claim that they do not exist. I do know this. If they do exist, they're not bothering us. And if they are visiting this earth, they are not a threat to the national security, just as the government says. And they're not running around mutilating cattle. They're not killing human beings. They're not the ones manipulating us 
into a one world government but instead if they exist and if they are visiting this earth they're being used to propel us into a one world government but I don't even think that's the case I believe that what's flying in our skies is of human origin and I can present a pretty good case for that a case that's very hard to refute however no one on the face of this earth can present a case for the existence of extraterrestrial life much less their visitation to this earth all the so-called proof that these people talk about is nothing but innuendo unsubstantiated claims a total 100 percent complete lack of any kind of physical evidence whatsoever In fact, several people have offered as much as one million dollars to anyone on this earth who could come forward with proof of extraterrestrial life. No one, not one person on the face of this globe and all of these wacko UFO people know about these rewards that have been offered. Not one single person has stepped up to present one ounce of proof. And the reason they don't, ladies and gentlemen, is because there is none. Because if there was some proof, in the extensive amount of research that I have done, I would have come across it. And that one million dollars would be in my pocket at this very instant. people out there have been ignoring the UFO phenomenon for too long. It has all the earmarks of the most successful, most sophisticated mind control operation in the history of the world, and you are ignoring it. What better way to implement a plan to bring about a one world government than to create, create the possibility in the minds of the people of the world that we are being threatened from some other species, from some other planet, and do it in a way that if anybody questions it, or challenged it, or wants to talk about it publicly, that they are ridiculed. And the ultimate goal is to make the Earth look very small, to present the people of the world with an external threat to this Earth, a superior race from some other planet, vastly superior to us, in intellect, philosophy, and technology in order to cause the dissolution of nation states, the dissolution of all existing religions, and the formation of the world totalitarian socialist government. This is being promulgated in many ways by television commercials, in the movies, in the newspapers, by creating incidents either real or imagined. I believe, because of my research, because of the extensive documentation that I've found and that is in my book, that this whole scenario has been created to give us an artificial alien threat from outer space.
at that time, uh, and, and even for many years afterwards, I did not believe that the government would use me in that way. I had devoted my whole life to government service. I had been in the Air Force. I was in the Navy. I was a river patrol boat captain in Vietnam. I had, uh, I had proved myself. I had combat ribbons with the V for Valor. Um, there was no doubt of my loyalty to my country. And maybe that's why it was so easy to use me, because I wouldn't doubt that what I saw was real. But over the years, I've done a lot of research. And what I've discovered is there's no proof existing anywhere that extraterrestrials are real or that have ever visited this planet, uh, or that they exist anywhere in the universe. There is not one shred of evidence anywhere. There is lots of evidence, tons of it in fact, that there are a group of people collectively known as the Illuminati who want us to believe in some extraterrestrial threat from space so that they can cause a world government, you know, bringing together of all the people to resist that external threat. Uh, and uh, the first time that I saw any reference to that, I was reading some papers from the Carnegie Endowment Fund, and there was a record of a speech, um, well, it was a dinner for Viscount Ishii of the Japanese delegation, the Japanese imperial delegation, in 1917. And John Dewey was, was one of the speakers. And the first sentence out of his mouth as I was reading this I almost fell out of my chair. Because this was in 1917, and he said the best way to cause all the people of the world to come together in, in one world government and end war forever would be if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet. And boy, that just clicked with me, and I knew that, uh, that, that this is just another scam. This is the age of deception. There's no doubt about it. And then uh, eight times during Reagan's administration, he inserted almost the exact same phrase into eight of his speeches. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? And um, it's a scam. <laughs> that's, that's what I can tell you. What they call UFOs, these craft that fly around the sky, are real. But they're not piloted by some little green guy from some other planet. They're owned and operated by the United States of America for one, the Soviet Union for another, uh, probably Great Britain, Canada. I think the, uh, the first really operable ones were probably manufactured in Western Canada, in the wilderness, in a, in a, in a place especially built to, to create those machines, like we created uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, and, and the same kind of secrecy surrounded it. So the technology is real. It's been kept secret and it's been used to promote this concept that there's an alien threat to this earth. When I was a corporate manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer. But he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played. That game being the effort to weaponize space, to control the Earth from space and space itself. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, the dirty commies, that whole story. First the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all 
was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. He didn't mention a timeline, but he said that it was going to be speeding up faster than anybody could possibly imagine. That the effort to put weapons in space was not only based on a lie, but would accelerate past the point of people even understanding it until it was already up there and too late. The cattle mutilations I've discovered in my research are nothing more than than what's left after the government uh, does its secret tests on the the low-level radiation leakage from its atomic weapons assembly plants and atomic power plants. It's a low-level radiation monitoring project. And if you look at what's missing in the cattle, you'll see that it's just as clear as day. They take the lips, they take the tongue, they take a six-inch patch of skin, they core out the the uh, rectum, the colon area, where those kinds of things would collect it. They would pass through the um, through the uh, digestive system. On, on female cows, they take the they take the udder uh, to check for low level radiation in the milk. Is it being passed to the to the calves? And and these are all grazing animals that graze on the grass that where the radiation falls when it falls from the air, and uh, it's just an incredible deception. And I'm just amazed that people have fallen for it in the manner that they have in the absence of any proof whatsoever. I mean, they cite hearsay as proof. Well, what about all of the alien abductions? They're not abductions. They're the results of a tremendously successful and very sophisticated mind control operation, all of which has been in development uh, well, they started working on those kinds of things since before World War II. But they have perfected them. On my website, I have a patent of a machine that can read your brain waves, can recombine them in a computer and send them back to you and make you think things happened that never happened. I mean, you can't get a patent for something like that unless it really works. You have to prove it to the patent office. It works. The patent was issued. And this is just one of the things that snuck by them that has it. Because when people invent things like this, they're sucked up by the government immediately, and then they're, they're put behind the veil of national security and classified, and then nobody knows about them. But every once in a while, something sneaks by them. And when you do these searches in the patent office and the trademark office and in the copyright office, you come up with some real gems once in a while, and that, that was one. Also, the congressional investigations into the, uh, the intelligence community has revealed the existence of these programs. I mean, there's, there's no secret about it. It's documented. Project Artichoke, Project MK Ultra, um, MK Naomi. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on all day long. And, uh, you know, if you had the time in your movie, we could lay out all the documentation, which is official government documentation and prove uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's true. But that's what it is. It's not extraterrestrials coming down. The human body cannot pass through walls or roofs uh, or, or through windows that are closed. You know, this is all the product of the imagination and, and people's willingness uh, to believe something because they want it to be true. I don't know why they would want it to be true. You see, because... If, if it were true, these are not friendly aliens. They're doing some terrible things to people. If I were to kidnap somebody, pass them up through the roof, and take them somewhere, and perform operations on them, and uh, take samples of semen and, and ova from their you know, reproductive organs and, and uh, plant thoughts in their mind and, and all this kind of stuff and then bring them back, guess where I'd be right now? In prison. That's kidnapping. It's criminal. It's a terrible thing. So uh, there, there's a uh, there's a morbid sense about all this too, as if people want to be hurt for some reason. I don't understand that. But that that certainly is something that uh, 
that somebody needs to look at. Why do people feel that this needs to be real? What in them says, I want to be abducted and abused and kidnapped and, and raped and, and uh, all of this stuff against my will? Because they seem to take uh, some kind of satisfaction that this is happening. And, and nobody's talking about the fact that this is a terrible thing to happen. If I were to do that to you, you wouldn't be too happy, would you? But somehow it's okay if an alien does it? I don't think so. It's all bullshit. It's a lie. Well, at this point, <laughs> I've done so much research on this. Um, I have to tell you, there's only one way this is going. There's going to be a civil war in this country. And I hope the outcome of the war will be the reinstatement of constitutional Republican government. But whenever you have a war like that, you're going to have competing factions to be the winner. And whoever really has the power in the end is going to institute whatever kind of government they feel should be there. There are people in this country who believe that a religious theology or theocracy uh, should prevail. Well, if that happened, we'd have burnings at the stake again and, and inquisitions and heretics and all of these kinds of things. So that can't be allowed to happen. Can't be. Doesn't matter what my religion is. It can't be allowed to happen. There are people who want a, a socialist uh, government, much like the one in Sweden. There are people who want to uh, create in the United States what the Soviet Union had hoped to be. Um, there are real Nazis, all of them socialists. Hitler was a socialist. So I see the future as being tremendously dangerous for all of us. Me and, and many others like me are, are going to perform a valiant attempt to reinstate, restore, legitimate, lawful, constitutional Republican government. Whether or not we're going to be successful, I can't tell you. But I will tell you that once this war starts, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be bloody, and it'll last for 10 or 15 years. That's the nature of this kind of conflict. If you look around at all these mountains around here, there's enough guns, ammunition, supplies, clothing, and food buried in these mountains to support an army for 15 years. And I, I don't think the American people realize that they're on the brink of a civil war. You see, there are many of us who took an oath when we went in the armed forces and we meant it. We volunteered. We weren't drafted. We care about this country. And the oath was to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And we will fulfill that oath, even if it means we die in the process of doing it. It's that simple. Something is wrong in America, no doubt about it. What is happening today, ladies and gentlemen, is very much the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany. The New World Order is going to be more like what Hitler envisioned than anything that Karl Marx ever dreamed about. And I look around and I see all of these people, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, all of these people who buy into the myth that socialism is going to liberate them. Socialism is going to re-enslave them. And it breaks my heart to work so hard to keep them free, only to see them working so hard to chain themselves once again. The 
the heart and soul of everything that is happening, ladies and gentlemen, in the world today. The driving force behind it is an ancient secret religion. At one time, the dim recesses of the ancient history of man, there was but one religion upon this earth, practiced by all men everywhere. It was the religion of the cosmos, the cosmology of the heavens. That is the heart and soul of the ancient pagan religions, which ultimately bore a philosophy which combined with science became the secret hidden religion of the ancient brotherhood. And it doesn't matter what you call it, Sabasius, Eusebius, Dionysius, Freemasonry, the Assassins, the Knights Templar, all of these orders practice and still practice to this day this hidden mystery religion. And it is the philosophy of this mystery religion that guides the agenda of the power that is directing world events today. The ultimate goal is to make the earth look very small, to present the people of the world with an external threat to this earth, a superior race from some other planet, vastly superior to us in intellect, philosophy, and technology in order to cause the dissolution of nation-states, the dissolution of all existing religions, and the formation of the world totalitarian socialist government. NASA is one of the main instruments of this deception. And is their religion that denies the existence of Jesus Christ, or even of a God, really. The closest they get to God is a sort of a pantheism but everything is put together. You've heard it in the New Age movement. As above, so below. If you step on an ant, it does something to somewhere on the moon. <laughs> that kind of thinking. John Dewey said, Someone once told me that the best way to end wars forever unite all humanity on this earth in a world government would be if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet. That's what he said, ladies and gentlemen, in 1917, and that's at least how old this hypothesis is. Or I should say this plan to deceive the world. It was tested in 1938 with the broadcast of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater's War of the Worlds to present a hoax to find out if it was believable, if the populace would fall for it, and they did. In all of the towns and cities that heard this broadcast, people were terrified. They went outside with shotguns and rifles to look for the alien tripods so that they could shoot them before they destroyed their cities and their families and their industries. But the thrust of this is to destroy religion, and in specific, the Christian religion, and any other religion that believes that man was created here on this earth by God. For they're going to say that these Martians created us by interbreeding with backward, unevolved animals here on this earth. 
and they're going to point to the place in Genesis where it talks about the Nephilim or the gods interbreeding with people here on this earth. How can Christianity or any other religion survive when the world is presented with what they would believe to be proof that life on this earth was not created by God but by some extraterrestrial advanced race from some other world? And that we have been owned by them and shepherded in our existence all through the history of the world. And that's the true purpose of the UFOs, flying saucers, and abduction reports, which are truly the end result of some very sophisticated mind control experimentation. The technology exists, ladies and gentlemen. I have seen it myself. It is owned and operated by the United States government and probably several other governments on this earth. It is truly marvelous technology, but it does not belong to extraterrestrials of any kind from anywhere. And the first realization of this massive, gigantic movement to protect the Earth from this alien threat would be a one-world totalitarian socialist government. Mark my words, this is one, this is only one of the contingency plans of those who want to bring this about, and they have at their disposal the technology that has already been used for many, many years to implant in the subconscious mind of the men and women, the people of the world, that the threat is real. Even though there is no proof anywhere existing upon the face of this earth or anywhere else that extraterrestrial beings exist, much less are visiting this earth. While I was on submarines, being junior in the Navy, real junior, I had to stand lookout watches. Lookouts are well-trained, professional observers. They are not just someone that they grab out of the galley and stick it there with a pair of binoculars. <laughs> you are well-trained because before you yell to the officer of the deck that you got to shoot at something coming at you off the port beam, you got to know that that's really the enemy and not the admiral coming out for a visit. <laughs> And that's really the main reason for it. <laughs> so, we were trained observers. Now, this is extremely important to me personally, because without this experience, I probably would not have limp the importance that the later information that I was going to see, I probably would not have realized how important it was while on lookout between the Portland, Seattle area and the Pearl Harbor area, while we were traveling on the surface as port lookout, I saw a craft the size of an aircraft carrier exit the water at a range of approximately two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter. The port quarter is approximately 45 de relative degrees off the port bow. Port is your left. Left port Wine is red, that's where the red light is on a ship. Okay, now we got through that. <laughs> I was stunned. I knew that I had just seen something that was absolutely incredible and nobody in the world would believe that I saw it and nobody else saw it. And I was faced with the dilemma. I'm the port lookout, something just came up out of the water that could destroy us in a second 
It was a machine. It was intelligently guided. I knew this. It was as big as an aircraft carrier. It was the most important, earth-shattering thing that had ever happened to me in my life because I saw it. I realized what it was. I knew I wasn't dreaming. There was nobody around who could be manipulating me in any way, shape, or form. And it was my responsibility to report this. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to tell the man who writes my performance report that I just saw this thing come out of the water? You've got to be nuts. But I had a responsibility to the safety of the ship, the boat, which we call submarines, boats, not ships, to the boat and to the crew. So I had to devise a method to report this. And what I did was I told the officer of the deck, Ensign Ball, I said, Ensign Ball, I saw something about two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter, but it just flashed and I don't know what it was. Could you please help me scour that area to see if we can find it again? Now, I didn't really believe that this thing was going to show up again at all. Well, the starboard lookout heard this conversation and he turned around and started looking too, which he shouldn't have done because you're never supposed to desert your own field of responsibility, but he did. At about that time, the object came, or this object, or another one just like it, came back down out of the clouds and entered the water. Ensign Ball dropped his binoculars, dropped his jaw, and turned around and just stared at me and didn't say a word. And then he turned back around and he just stared off into space for a couple of minutes. And then he turned around and looked at me again. And he said, this had to happen on my watch. <laughs> He then called the captain to the bridge, which on any naval vessel means that there is an emergency in progress. You do not call the captain to the bridge unless there is an emergency situation, unless his presence is needed. If you call the captain to the bridge and his presence is not needed, you are in deep, deep, deeper than the submarine will dive to trouble. <laughs> And it's lucky they didn't have submarines in the old Navy when they killed people. <laughs> now, the captain came to the bridge, and so did the chief quartermaster, because it was his job to come to the bridge with the captain, with a 35-millimeter camera, any time anything like this happened. This event repeated itself several times over a 7- to 10-minute period, and we watched it. They would exit the water, go and disappear in the clouds, and then another ship, or the same ship, would re-enter the water. We were told by the captain before we left the con, the bridge, not to discuss it with the other crew members, that it was classified top secret, and that we were never to mention it to anyone. Now, the crew knew about it. How they knew about it, I don't know, but I suspect that it was picked up on sonar and radar also, in which case the sonar men and the radar men would know about it too. And I believe that is what has happened, and I believe that they were also told not to talk to anyone. But several crew members came up to me and wanted to know if we really saw a UFO, and I told them uh, that I was not allowed to discuss what happened, uh, and I didn't know what I saw anyway. So that was the end of that. When we arrived in Pearl Harbor, a officer from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and debriefed each one of us independently of the others. I do not know what went on in the debriefings of the other personnel involved, but when I went in, he began to ask me <coughs> what I saw. When I began to describe to him what I saw, he became very upset, even enraged. And having come from a military family, having a father who was an Air Force pilot and an officer, having served four years in the Air Force, I knew what this man wanted to hear. It was obvious to me. So I told him what he wanted to hear so that I didn't have to go through with what I knew I would have to go through if I told him anything else. So I told him, sir, I did not see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, that's the spirit. <laughs> I had to sign a security oath. I was dismissed, told that I was a good sailor, had a good future with the Navy, and I left. 
On the way out, Seaman DiGirolamo was braced up against the bulkhead in the passageway, and I whispered to him, tell him you didn't say anything. <laughs> and I don't know whether he did or not, because we never talked about it again amongst ourselves. For the New Age, like the Masons, feel that Christianity is the enemy. A force to be countered, not by open debate, but by contempt and ridicule, and as shall be illustrated later, by even murder. And remember, the source of the New Age movement is the order of the Freemason. Other parties wish to join the debate. In 1911, the Socialist Party of Great Britain published a pamphlet entitled Socialism and Religion, in which they placed their position about religion into the arena. Quote, it is therefore a profound truth that socialism is the natural enemy of religion. A Christian socialist is in fact an anti-socialist. Christianity is the antithesis of socialism. Unquote. So the socialist, the New Ager, and the Mason have declared war on the Christians. And, as in every war, the enemy must be defeated even by bloodshed if necessary. This war has deep roots in history, and I will cover those roots so that you will understand it perfectly where this came from. This war is no different. Bloodshed is anticipated by all parties in the battle. Lavetti Lafferty and Bud Hollowell, two New Agers, started the discussion about how their religion sanctions the use of violence against the Christian community. They wrote the following in their book entitled The Eternal Dance, quote, This is a time of opportunity for those who will take it, apparently meaning the New Agers, the initiates of the mystery religions, socialists. For others, apparently the Christians, if the earth is unsuitable for them, if they will not accept the New Age religion, they will go on to other worlds, unquote, which simply means they will be exterminated. You better listen to me, folks. I am a messenger, and my message is unmistakable, and it had better not fall upon deaf ears, for those deaf ears will be rendered dead in the coming New World Order. You see, they have made incredible admissions, but none of you are looking, none of you are reading, none of you are absorbing. In fact, most of you are so stupid that you think that the only thing you should read is what you personally believe in or agree with. How can you exist in this world ignorant of the opinions and the writings and the thoughts of everyone else, including your enemies? The words reveal an incredible scenario. You see, these people in the third world nations are going to be entirely replaced by what they call, quote, a new root race, unquote. That eventuality will not be a tragedy. Quote, John Randolph Price was told by his spirit guide that up to two and one half billion might perish in the coming chaos, unquote. Another estimate of the number required to die because they will not accept the new religion was offered by the so-called Tibetan master, Wal Kool, who has said in one of his channeling experiences that one-third of all humanity must die. Some of the believers claim that they have the ability to call forth the deceased spirit of someone who lived many years before. Quite often, these spirits claim to be the ascended masters, those who have gone on to discover the eternal truths of all creation. One such believer who claimed to be in touch with a master was Alice Bailey, previously mentioned. Her spirit called himself Wall Cool, and she claimed he spoke through her saying, quote, Death is not a disaster to be feared. The work of the destroyer is not really cruel or undesirable. Therefore, there is much destruction permitted by the custodians of the plan, and much evil turned into good, unquote. Now, just what the plan constituted was told to the world by Benjamin Prim, another New Age leader. He placed an advertisement in about 20 newspapers all over the world on April the 25th, April the 25th, 1982, that defined the term. The ad read in part, quote, 
What is the plan? It includes the installation of a new world government and new world religion under Maitreya, unquote. But perhaps the most startling example of the teachings of this new religion came from the pen of Barbara Marx Hubbard, one of her most articulate writers, and she wrote in her book entitled Happy Birthday, Planet Earth, quote, The choice is, do you wish to become a natural Christ, a universal human, or do you wish to die? People will either change or die, that is the choice, unquote. The New World Order has convinced us that their plan is just about the nuts and bolts of the police state system, cameras and ID chips. But the real agenda requires those who are close to understanding first to be prepared to accept the new false utopia. But it is the false utopia that they refer to when they say New World Order, not the build up to it. And it will come on the heels of 2012 if they can get the idea to as many people as possible. It's really the only way to get the so-called truth seekers to be on board. Then people will willingly give up their weapons and their borders and their constitutions if they can be convinced that they're only part of an intergalactic race of people that are no longer subject to any god. One passage that I've secretly had a lot of trouble with, that I couldn't understand how it could happen in this politically correct, technologically advanced world we live in. It says that in the New World Order, people will rejoice in the killing of Christians, and that if they don't go along with the beast system, will be publicly executed. It wasn't until I really understood what was being said by the 2012 propaganda that it finally made sense. Just look around. How many of those truth movement teachers, especially those connected with theosophy like Tessarian and Maxwell, that pushed 2012 also tell you that Christianity is the enemy and imply that it must be destroyed for humanity to survive? If you hate Christians and Judaism, there's a very good chance that you have been brainwashed by the real New World Order. The battle lines are drawn. Choices will have to be made. I have made my choice. What is yours? What is yours? What is yours? What is yours? based upon documents that I'd seen while I was attached to the intelligence briefing team, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. At that time, uh, and, and even for many years afterwards, I did not believe that the government would use me in that way. I had devoted my whole life to government service. I had been in the Air Force, I was in the Navy, I was a river patrol boat captain in Vietnam, I had, uh, I had proved myself, I had combat ribbons with the V for the Valor. Um, there was no doubt of my loyalty to my country and maybe that's why it was so easy to use me because I wouldn't doubt that what I saw was real but over the years I've done a lot of research what I've discovered is there's no proof existing anywhere that extraterrestrials are real or that have ever visited this planet uh, or that they exist anywhere in the universe there is not one shred of evidence anywhere there is lots of evidence tons of it in fact that there are a group of people collectively known as the Illuminati who want us to believe in some extraterrestrial threat from space so that they can cause a world government you know bringing together of all the people to resist that external threat we only need gaze back from Vietnam to today to see the extent to which these false flag operations hoaxed events, exaggerated threats can stampede a populace and the Congress and the presidency into very dangerous and bad decisions. Now the mother load, the, the, the sort of the crown jewel of that kind of event is what has been planned assiduously since the 1950s and that is a threat from outer space that is alien that would unite the world around a military junta, a militarism, that would put all of humanity together, but against one or more 
extraterrestrial races. Now that plan, which they came up with in the 1950s, has been very carefully rolled out. I mean, this is, if you were to rank this on a scale of one to 10 of sensitive compartmented intelligence, information, this is a, as high as it goes, 10. Now, I've had it confirmed, and it's gonna be in our movie, Unacknowledged. One of the people that's going to be in this movie is an Air Force Office of Special Investigations counterintelligence officer who confirms the false flag. Name, rank, serial number. Confirms the military's involvement in staging the abductions of humans, making it look alien. Confirms that he carried bags of cash to people in the mainstream media to influence st stories and coverage of this issue. They have been uh, wanting a certain acculturation around UFOs and ETs for the purpose of having the public think that it could be true, but they don't really know what it is. So right now, more than half the public over this longitudinal, long-term psychological propaganda warfare program launched in the 50s believe UFOs are real. They believe there's intelligent life in the universe. But that's about where the, the, the granular knowledge ends. There's not a lot of granular knowledge detailed knowledge of what all this is. There's another category, and this is more difficult to understand, and that is electromagnetic assets. And these include electromagnetic systems that could optically, like a very advanced hologram, simulate an event. Electromagnetic systems that have been called popularly electronic warfare systems that are psychotronic and radionic that interface with consciousness and thought, and electromagnetic systems that can affect large segments of the population when targeted. Now these began to be developed quite uh, in, in an advanced fashion by the 40s and 50s. And by 1956, uh, it had been accomplished to the point of state of the art. And uh, the first time that I saw any reference to that, I was reading some papers from the Carnegie Endowment Fund, and there was a record of a speech. Um, well, it was a dinner for Viscount Ishii of the Japanese delegation, the Japanese Imperial delegation, in 1917. And John Dewey was, was one of the speakers. And the first sentence out of his mouth, as I was reading this, almost fell out of my chair. Because this was in 1917, and he said, the best way to cause all the people of the world to come together in, in one world government and end war forever would be if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet. And boy, that just clicked with me, and I knew that, uh, that, that this is just another scam. This is the age of deception, there's no doubt about it. And then uh, eight times during Reagan's administration, he inserted almost the exact same phrase into eight of his speeches. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev. When you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together well I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us, we can bring about that realization. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish 
if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? I think maybe I'd answer it this way. I, I keep in my frustration sometimes, you know, actually, if you count some of the things going on in smaller countries and all, there have been about 114 wars since World War II. But I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet? Wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all? We were all human beings, citizens of the world, and wouldn't we come together to fight that particular threat? And um, it's a scam. <laughs> that's, that's what I can tell you. What they call UFOs, these craft that fly around the sky, are real but they're not piloted by some little green guy from some other planet. They're owned and operated by the United States of America for one, the Soviet Union for another, uh, probably Great Britain, Canada. I think the, uh, the first really operable ones were probably manufactured in Western Canada, in the wilderness, in a, in a, in a place especially built to, to create those machines like we created uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, and, and the same kind of secrecy surrounded it. So the technology is real. It's been kept secret and it's been used to promote this concept that there's an alien threat to this earth. The cattle mutilations I've discovered in my research are nothing more than, than what's left after the government uh, does its secret tests on the, the low-level radiation leakage from its atomic weapons, assembly plants, and atomic power plants. It's a low-level radiation monitoring project. And if you look at what's missing in the cattle, you'll see that it's just as clear as day. They take the lips, they take the tongue, they take a six-inch patch of skin, they core out the, the uh, rectum, the colon area, where those kinds of things would collect if they would pass through the, um, through the uh, digestive system. On, on female cows, they take the, they take the udder to check for low-level radiation in the milk as it being passed to the, to the calves. And, and these are all grazing animals that graze on the grass that where the radiation falls when it falls from the air. It's not quite up there with the 1947 Roswell incident, but the cow mutilations of the 70s remain one of New Mexico's biggest mysteries. Now there's a new book about it, and the author says he knows exactly what happened to all those cows. News 13's Amanda Goodman has the story. Amanda? Jess, the book was written by the son of the lead New Mexico State Police investigator. A warning, some of the images are graphic. A lot of the cattle were found with broken bones. They were found with harness marks that, because they were being lifted in some type of harness or clamp marks on their hooves or legs. That was life for ranchers in northern New Mexico in the mid to late 1970s. Cows were turning up dead, their carcasses mutilated and no one knew why. People need to know what really happened and hopefully this book will set the record straight. Greg Valdez is the author of Dulce Base, a new book about the cow mutilations. His dad, Gabe Valdez, was the lead investigator on the case for state police back in the 70s. The book is made up of his old case files. The evidence in the book will show um, that humans were involved in the mutilations. Officer Valdez's theory that government agencies were snatching the cattle for super secret Cold War experiments at an underground base in Dulce. Ranchers would routinely see them at night, you know, before they went to bed. And then the next morning they would find them dead in the field or the pasture. Officer Valdez believed these government agencies returned the cattle to perpetuate the theory that aliens were responsible to shield themselves from suspicion. The more people look in the wrong direction and toward aliens and stuff that's not supported by evidence, no one will ever be held accountable and it will just be a mystery. It's a move Valdez's son says has worked for the last four decades and something he hopes the book will put an end to. Someone has, should be held accountable. 
Some of the other theories about what happened to the cattle included alien abductions, that the cows simply died of natural causes, and predators were responsible for the mutilation. Valdez says all evidence suggests humans were the ones responsible. Jess. Okay, Amanda, Gay Valdez died two years ago. His son says he doesn't think the government will ever own up to what really happened. And uh, it's just an incredible deception. And I'm just amazed that people have fallen for it in the manner that they have in the absence of any proof whatsoever. I mean, they cite hearsay as proof. Well, what about all of the alien abductions? They're not abductions, they're the results of a tremendously successful and very sophisticated mind control operation, all of which has been in development, uh, well, they started working on those kinds of things since before World War II, but they have perfected them. On my website, I have a patent of a machine that can read your brainwaves, can recombine them in a computer and send them back to you and make you think things happened that never happened. I mean, you can't get a patent for something like that unless it really works. You have to prove it to the patent office. It works, a patent was issued. And this is just one of the things that snuck by them that hasn't, because when people invent things like this, they're sucked up by the government immediately, and then they're, they're put behind the veil of national security and classified, and then nobody knows about them. But every once in a while, something sneaks by them. And when you do these searches, the patent office and the trademark office and in the copyright office, you come up with some real gems once in a while. That, that was one. Hundreds of people in the valley say they are hearing voices in their heads. And those voices are being transmitted by microwave or other methods. Well, several viewers asked us to investigate what they call electronic harassment. KMIR 6's Angela Monroe joins us now with what she's discovered. Angela. Electronic harassment, synthetic telepathy, voice to school technology. Chances are you haven't heard of these terms, but after searching the internet, I found dozens of websites dedicated to the phenomenon and several Valley residents who say they're victims. How much more can you invade me than to go into my brain? It sounds like somebody else is reading the book, only it's thoughts. We're not having a group hallucination. This is actually something that's happening. These men all live in the area, didn't know each other before the voices started, and say someone is playing mind games with them. Mostly it's a lot of derogatory uh, comments about whatever you're thinking about. Only time I ever had a whole sentence, he said, this is not about you, which just frosted me. If it's not about me, what the hell am I going through all this for? Kevin Bond says he used to have a normal life. I was living in the San Diego area. I uh, was clerking for a federal judge and I noticed that I was being followed by a whole bunch of people. According to the websites, what Bond is describing is called gang stalking. He moved to Palm Springs to escape. I started hearing, as you'll hear, the hearing voices and what they'll call voice to skull or microwave hearing. Bob Stansfield says his experience was similar and started a decade ago. They were active and following me around here and I started hearing the, the, the voices uh, a little bit after the, the uh, uh, vehicular stalking. Randall Ringer says the voices started when he was undergoing chemotherapy. The first thing that was said was Randall Ringer and I sat up straight and I went to the bath, into the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, looked myself in the eyes, and I said, did that really happen? Bond says he's found more than 300 victims locally and is tracking others across the state through billboards. In Johnson Valley, a Freedom House just opened to help people who believe they are being targeted. To many of you who find yourselves uh, the, the object of covert harassment, that there is hope and that you are not alone and that we are striving uh, to, uh, to find legislation uh, for, and we're working towards freedom for all. Derek Robinson leads a national group called Freedom from Covert Harassment and Surveillance. He says he knows who's playing mind games. Rogue government officials that are uh, sponsoring this. Um, also corrupt business officials and um, private citizens. And he also told us how. Most of it is delivered by microwave and I believe it's satellite delivered. Uh, whether someone is uh, on a remote location using a, a laptop 
or next door using the desktop. Bond says neurotransmitter chips that run off body electricity have been inserted into some people. And they assign cell phone numbers to them. The cell phone numbers are then run through a computer and a computer translates your thoughts. This crime has been available to the, to, uh, the military for 60 years. We sat down with local psychiatrist Dr. Alan Drucker to get his professional opinion. There's no scientific evidence and there's no objective evidence to show that what they believe to be happening is factually true. So what does the doctor believe is behind these voices? Information that I found on many of these websites uh, really confirms or is uh, consistent with what I see in delusional disorders. But these men disagree. I've been to a psychiatrist and they gave me anti-schizophrenia medication and it did absolutely nothing whatsoever. However, Dr. Drucker says delusional disorder has no real medical treatment and is believed to start because of disrupted dopamine pathways in the brain. These pathways then start to fire or get triggered in the absence of actual stimulation of a person actually speaking or the radio being on, etc. Dr. Drucker says dopamine can be disrupted for a variety of reasons, a genetic predisposition, illicit drugs, and even chemotherapy. These men have their own theories why they're being harassed. I think that I was targeted because I'm gay. I reported uh, people, someone, um, for selling what I, I thought they were selling drugs, and they, they were. Nationwide, this crime is committed about 60 percent uh, against white women ages from 30 to 38. But in Palm Springs, it's almost 98% gay men. But it does tend to occur more in populations of individuals who are marginalized or in some way stigmatized in society. But these men disagree and say police and the psychiatric community need to take them seriously. When I worked with the government, I heard a lot of people coming in saying, I'm hearing voices through my tooth. Now I look back and I think, are they like I am now and I just didn't pay attention? For them, the voices are a waking nightmare. Also, the congressional investigations into the, uh, the intelligence community has revealed the existence of these programs. And there's, there's no secret about it. It's documented. Project Artichoke, Project MK Ultra, uh, MK Naomi. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on all day long. And, uh, you know, if you had the time in your movie, we could lay out all the documentation, which is official government documentation and prove uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's true. Well, there was a, a large series of Senate hearings in the mid-70s, mid to late 70s, and then a whole round of declassification of documents. And basically, not much of anything's been declassified since then. So we learned that uh, the CIA was formed in 1947. Its first documented mind control program began in April 1950, which was called Bluebird which was three months before the start of the Korean War. And the, the disinformation about that was that the mind control programs were all reactive to what the communist Chinese were doing during the Korean War, but clearly not true. And then there was just a series of projects. So Bluebird became Artichoke, which became MKUltra, which became MK Search, which runs up to 1973. And then there was parallel programs MK Naomi and a bunch of others. And they involved all kinds of different experiments, uh, some of which sound like science fiction. And contracts with many of the major universities with investigators cleared at top secret and knowing it was CIA money. Well, one of the experiments was done at Ionia State Hospital. This is MKUltra, uh, which is in Michigan. And all the psychiatrists involved who were cleared at top secret were former military doctors and the, basically the experiment was they take incarcerated sex offenders who are in a mental hospital, they interrogate them using um, various kinds of drugs, marijuana, amphetamines, alcohol and so on. And what they're trying to do is extract information from them about crimes they've committed for which they've never been charged. So uh, the whole idea then being, well, if we can draw some information out of these guys, Maybe when we're interrogating foreign agents, we can do the same. And there was a, a team called the Artichoke Team, which did interrogations uh, in safe houses on, they didn't say exactly who it was, but it was actual people of interest, foreign agents and so on. 
And the artichoke team used the artichoke method, which included IV drugs, alcohol, good cop, bad cop, sensory deprivation, sensory isolation, all these techniques that were studied under this series of programs. Uh, another, uh, let's see, this is now, we're in the uh, late 50s into early 60s. In MK Ultra, a program that was called Operation Midnight Climax, which is extremely thoroughly documented. Uh, people who were former agents of what was the Bureau of Narcotics, which is now the DEA, uh, basically built safe houses and built uh, in those safe houses what looked like a brothel setup. And when you look at the requisitions, it's like satin sheets and all kinds of things to hang on the wall. And the, um, the guys running the program hired prostitutes to go out and pick up guys at bars, bring them back to the safe house, have sex with them, dose them with LSD without their knowledge, and the CIA guys would watch through a one-way mirror. So if that wasn't documented, you would just think somebody made that up. But that's what it is. It's not extraterrestrials coming down. The human body cannot pass through walls or roofs uh, or, or through windows that are closed. You know, this is all the product of the imagination and, and people's willingness uh, to believe something because they want it to be true. I don't know why they would want it to be true. You see, because if, if it were true, these are not friendly aliens. They're doing some terrible things to people. If I were to kidnap somebody, pass them up through the roof, take them somewhere, perform operations on them, and, and take samples of semen and, and ova from their you know, reproductive organs and, and uh, plant thoughts in their mind and, and all this kind of stuff and then bring them back, guess where I'd be right now? In prison. It's kidnapping. It's criminal. It's a terrible thing. So uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a morbid sense about all this, too, as if people want to be hurt for some reason. I don't understand that. But that, that certainly is something that, uh, that somebody needs to look at. Why do people feel that this needs to be real? What in them says, I want to be abducted and abused and kidnapped and, and raped and, and uh, all of this stuff against my will? Because they seem to take some kind of satisfaction that this is happening. Stories of UFO sightings and alien abductions date back centuries. And unless President Trump declassifies the Area 51 files, rumors of aliens and the men in black who protect us will always remain. But my next guest says the rumors are true because he says he was abducted by aliens 45 years ago. Calvin Parker joins me now. All right, so Calvin, just so I understand this and we'll make it easy for the audience to understand, you were, claim you were abducted when you were with a friend 45 years ago, um, and now that your friend has unfortunately passed away, you feel comfortable sharing it because he didn't want to really go too public with it. But let's start from the beginning. You were walking where and what happened? We were fishing. We actually got off work in past Pagula, Mississippi, and was fishing at the old Shaw Peter shipyard. And that's where something come in from behind us. And I'm not for sure if it was aliens or what it was, but I'm just assuming it was. And they landed behind us and three of them got out and took, uh, two of them got a hold of Charlie and one got a hold of myself. Okay, one second. Aboard. Okay, okay, so when, when they were coming down, what were they in? Were they in some sort of spacecraft? Well, no, I was facing the river, and we just seen some lights behind us. So when we turned around, the light got so bright, and they was already there. We didn't even hear them land. They okay. was probably the, the length of a football field behind us. So what did they look so, like when they came into your line of vision? Well, they had kind of gray wrinkled skin like a uh, elephant or a manatee or something. And then when we got on board, one looked a little, uh, you know, a little more like a human than a, than an elephant like that, but a kind of female looking creature. Okay, so maybe a female alien. And then they, what did they do to you when they took you up in space or wherever they took you? Well, they 
when I was aboard the ship, the female reached and run her finger down my throat and tried to mess with my nasal cavity, looked in my nose, and there was something that come out of the ceiling and uh, it just clicked about four times and I figured it was like an x-ray or something, whatever they use. And they went back up in the ceiling. Then she summons the old big ugly when it come got me and he took me back outside and set me down at the river. Okay, were, you, were you a, were you terrified? Were you? How did you feel when you were being, um, I wouldn't maybe probed is the wrong word, but examined by the female alien? I was scared. I was naturally afraid, and uh, I think they give us an ejection though of some kind when they got us, and that, that's what we assumed when we got to the hospital the next day. Hmm. Then they took us to uh, Keesler to check us and, for radiation. And, and you and you you say you passed a polygraph test. Is that true? I did a polygraph, a voice stress test. Wow. There was eye, eye witnesses to this account. Wow. I and mean, Doctor Ford still from the, the top of the show also passed a polygraph. So, I don't know what to make of that. All right, listen, Calvin. I, I appreciate you coming on and, and telling us your story, and uh, I wish you the best of luck in life. It sounds like you're you're doing just fine, and. Uh, you know, if they ever come get you, you again, tell them to come visit Waters World, all right? I'm ready I will. to receive them. <laughs> uh, you know, if anybody has a doubt about the credibility of the story, they'll read the book, Paspagula, The Closest Encounter, My Story, Calvin Parker. It's documented in there. Every little thing in that book is documented. All right. All right. Well, and, Calvin, uh, I'm glad you came onto Waters World, and uh, thanks for sharing your thank story. Thank you for Appreciate having me. It. Nobody's talking about the fact that this is a terrible thing to happen. If I were to do that to you, you wouldn't be too happy, would you? But somehow it's okay if an alien does it? I don't think so. It's all bullshit. It's a lie.